Today we're going to be looking at what does it look like to have a discipleship culture as a church? So not just me being a disciple, not just me as an individual being a disciple maker, although we need to understand and really lean into both of those things. But what about us as a body? What about us as a church, us as a family of Jesus here? What does it look like for us to be disciple makers? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Our key text, just like we've done the last couple of weeks, is we're looking at where is this shown in, in Scripture, in the New Testament church? Where do we see this in action? Where do we see being disciples in action? Where do we see disciple making in action? And today, what does a culture of discipleship in the family of Jesus look like? So I'm going to read to you from Acts 2, where we see a picture of discipleship in action, in community, as a culture of the church. Then we're going to pray and we'll get get stuck into it. Let's let's, uh, read together from Acts 2. Or you can just hear if you want. They, this is the church. In fact, the very first church. It's the very... First, the first time they're called a church, the first Christians who have ever existed. Jesus has just resurrected from the dead, gathered his disciples, and he told them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so he says, because of this, go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't say go and just tell everyone about me, although he does say that later. He says, you'll be my witnesses. He says, go and make disciples. It doesn't say make converts. It doesn't say get decisions. His command is, our, our, our newly inaugurated King Jesus gathers his first disciples and he says, here church, here's your mission. Go and make disciples of every nation. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says, and I'll be with you till the very end. And so in obedience to King Jesus' command, these disciples get about doing what he has commanded them to do, to make disciples. And this is what it looked like as they did that. Acts 2 verse 42 says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Let's pray, see what God would have for us today. So, Father, as we again consider your scriptures, we're asking for your help to understand them, to be formed by them, and to live in light of them. Our hope is that we would bring you glory with our lives. Our hope is that we'd be able to live lives of obedience to our King Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, in a way that fills us with joy, and whether it sees many come to know you, many become sons and daughters, many grow into the likeness of your son Jesus in a way that brings us joy and brings you glory and is for the good of those we serve. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And tonight I'm asking, by your Spirit, would you minister to our hearts and our minds today? In the name of Jesus, amen. So how did the first church do discipleship? And what, we, what do we learn from this? First, he says they were dedicated. Actually, a couple of times. The disciples were dedicated. This mission of discipleship and disciple making, of loving one another, of being about the business of their big brother and their saviour, Jesus, wasn't something that they just bolted onto their lives. It wasn't like they said, well, okay, I've been, I've been going this way and I'm living my life. Now I've heard about Jesus and that's amazing. Thank you, Jesus. That's wonderful. I'm just going to bolt Jesus onto my life, going as I was going before, but now I'm adding Jesus. Or <clears throat> discipleship is a list of options, 
uh, uh, sorry, an option in a list of options. And as I feel like I want to, I will engage in that option. But as I don't feel like it, I'll do other options. Rather, it says the first disciples were dedicated. They oriented, the, the, oriented their lives around this new way of living. It meant that it wasn't just an option, a list of options. It was the primary thing they oriented their lives around. What do they dedicate their lives to? It tells us they dedicated their lives to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is the, the way that the apostles proclaimed Jesus and preached the Old Testament Scriptures in light of who Jesus was and what he had done. And then the words that the apostles wrote and the words that were written about the apostles. So basically, they're saying they dedicated themselves to Scripture. What we know as Scripture is the teaching of the apostles. So we likewise, at Cedar Light, have dedicated ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to every God-breathed word in Scripture. We have dedicated ourselves to it in the way that was taught by the apostles. So how do we understand the Old Testament? We understand it in light of Jesus. How do we read the New Testament? In light of Jesus, the way the apostles taught. It's our plumb line. It's how we know God's will for us because the Scripture tells us, this is God's will for you on multiple occasions. So we are dedicated, like the early church, those first disciples and disciple makers. They weren't just, well, they weren't hoarding information. They went, hoarding, well, we know about Jesus, so we're going to keep this secret knowledge to us so that we have Jesus and you guys don't. But rather, they, they, as disciples of Jesus, taught disciples of Jesus. And they dedicated themselves, the Scripture says, to this teaching. What else? <clears throat> they dedicated themselves to fellowship, to gathering. I mean, really to one another. They were dedicated to one another. They didn't treat the family of God, again, in, as an option in a list of options. There wasn't a bolt onto their life. They radically reoriented their lives around the Lordship of Jesus and His family. And we do, we do likewise. As we think about discipleship, how do we build a discipling culture? We also reorient our lives around the Lordship of Jesus and around being His family. Meeting together in 2024 has become severely neglected and undervalued. It didn't just start at the beginning of COVID when we were forced to socially distance, and which became then relationally distance, distancing. <clears throat> um, for, for many, when that kind of hit four years ago, many people were like, oh, this is kind of like a holiday. This is kind of nice. Get to work from home, do some Zoom meetings. That very soon, very quickly turned into Zoom loathing. We hated doing online meetings. And so we just didn't, we went from relating in person to relating online to not relating at all. And we had this little snap back where we went, you know, we, were, we were allowed, we were encouraged again to um, come together. And we're like, yay, we're together. But we developed unhelpful habits and unhelpful ways of thinking about gathering. Again, it, pre, it predated COVID, but it, it became accentuated during COVID and exists afterwards, where we would treat the church, our family, we, start, we started to treat our family as consumers. We would come to church maybe to hear a sermon or maybe because we needed, we needed a pump up for the week ahead or maybe we were discouraged and just wanted to come and get some encouragement <clears throat> or we love music, we wanted to come and enjoy the music. Now, I want to tell you, all of these things are wonderful parts of, of our gatherings. But we gather because we are family. If you gathered primarily to hear a sermon, then you might come to a Sunday and say, well, <clears throat> here's my option in a list of options and I could just listen to the sermon later. Or there are far better preachers I could hear on Spotify or watch on YouTube. So I'm just going to do that this week and that, that will be my church this week. Can you imagine... Can you imagine thinking about your family in that sense, in that kind of way? Where you think, well, <clears throat> family, family meal, uh, family barbecue, well, I could just barbecue at home. Therefore, I'll do my family gathering at home. Abstract of my family. It's, 
it seems ridiculous when we think about family that way, but these are the kinds of, of words that we use to describe the family gathering of Jesus in this kind of sense. Now, I'm not trying to heap any kind of guilt onto you. I'm not trying to say there are no good reasons to not be at church. There are many good reasons to not be at church. What I'm trying to say is if we want to have a discipling culture like that first church did, we want to reorient our lives around Jesus and his way of life. The sermon is not the main reason we meet together. We, we do want to learn together. They dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's part of what we're doing here. But gathering is good in its own right, for its, in its own sense. You can't disciple somebody abstract of community with that person. You can't be discipled abstract of community with that person. And we can't have a discipling culture in community if we have no community. If we're just discrete, compartmentalized, indiv like atomistic individuals who come together to receive religious goods and services for an hour on a Sunday and then abstract ourselves again for the rest of the week. Does this make sense? We're family. We, we're beholden to one another. We are here to disciple one another and to be discipled. We can't do that abstract of each other. We can't... <clears throat> If you can't be in a Sunday gathering, absolutely. Like download the sermon or stream it online later while you jog or work out or clean or drive or work or whatever. That's not a substitute for family, for the gathering. We, we want to have really good teaching. That's not the reason that we gather. We gather because we're the family of Jesus. We need our brothers and our sisters, those sitting around us. We can't do church abstract of church. What else? It says they dedicated themselves to breaking of bread. <clears throat> Part of, it's mentioned a couple of times actually in this passage. Uh, in one instance, it's talking about just being in each other's homes. They broke bread together. They ate together. It was valued among them that they would be in each other's lives. There's a kind of a, the sense in which um, it's, it's kind of a slowing down. When you eat together, there's a slowing down. There is a purpose, sure, it's eating, but you're forced to commune with one another when you sit down for a meal together. Firstly, you're seated. You're not, it's not like a 10-minute stand-up, let's check in and then I'll go about my day. It is a, we are, we are communing with one another. There might even be a, we're preparing food together, we're bringing food together, we're coming together to eat. It has its own value. And the other breaking of bread is talking about participating in the Lord's Supper. They were specifically meeting together. They were dedicating themselves to, in obedience to Jesus' command, to break bread and drink the wine, that they would do this together. Again, community is not just a tack on to our gatherings. We do it every week. In, you know, in obedience to Jesus. But it's not just a tack on that we do at the end of our gatherings. If anything, for me, it is the, it's the pinnacle of our family gatherings. We come together and we participate in a kind of a meal. I mean, for me, this is, yes, it's communion, what we do around the table here. But it's more of a, it's more of a picture of communion, which is the family meal. We eat together, we break bread, and we drink the cup to remind ourselves of Jesus. And it says that their first disciples dedicated themselves to eating in each other's homes and remembering Jesus around the table. It says they were dedicated to prayer, probably specific prayers, like the prayers. They dedicated themselves to the prayers, which again, in terms of discipleship, shows us that they weren't just, <clears throat> they weren't just making converts. They were teaching people how to pray. Jesus had taught his disciples how to pray, and Jesus' disciples were teaching their disciples how to pray. And no doubt, those disciples would then teach their disciples how to pray. They were, they were dedicating themselves to the prayer. So I'm not saying that what we want to do is just have like a, some rote prayers that we learn and dispassionately recite them in our gatherings. Uh, we, when we pray, we are, we're speaking with and listening to the, the God who loves us, the Father who loves us, who's speaking to us by His Holy Spirit, 
present with us, speaking to us, ministering to us, listening to us, prompting us. We believe that the Spirit prompts us to pray for the things that as we obediently ask God for those things, He will, in His providence and sovereignty, give us those things so that we can say, thank you, praise you, God, for giving us the things you prompted us to ask for. That He delights in answering prayers. That He wants to speak to us by His Spirit and minister to us and move through us and do a work through us, even by His Holy Spirit. Everything that we think about that's been wonderful, that's happened at Cedar Light Church, we can draw a direct line from that wonderful thing back to us asking for that thing in prayer. That God is very good and delights to answer prayers. Every church we've planted out of here has been an answer to prayer. Every one of the hundreds of people who have met Jesus and the hundreds more who have grown into his likeness, the hundreds of people who have baptized here, every one who have been able to draw, like, draw a line back to, God has prompted one or many of us to pray and that God has done that thing. It's wonderful. When we pray in, in a discipling culture, in a discipling relationship, it's to say we are putting this thing together. Let's pray together. Not that there are some among us who are special, like A-plus pro-Christians, that God specifically listens to those guys, but not us, not us new Christians or lower Christians. But that as a discipling culture, we who are mature teach, or people who are disciple makers teach disciples how to pray. To show here, here's what I'm looking for, I need in my life. I need to overcome sin. I need for healing. I need for a restored relationship. I need for whatever it is. And to show people how we pray. To teach them how to pray, like Jesus taught us how to pray. And prayer is how we spend time with our loving Father. What else do they do? They witness many signs, many wonders done by the apostles. And we can see these many signs as we read through Scripture. But we also know God is continuing to do many signs through his people today. And again, it's not just a, you know, you're a new, you're a new convert or you've just met Jesus. You know, go out and, and Christian Rambo all by yourself, go and do it. But rather, in a discipling culture, we teach people, we show people. He is how God moves by his Holy Spirit. It's what God wills and loves to do among his people. And again, primarily to bring them from death to life, to bring them from darkness to light, to bring them from rebels under the wrath of God to sons and daughters gloriously redeemed. And again, in his, in his goodness, in his kindness, God has used very regular ordinary disciples at City Light hundreds and hundreds of times to see people move from darkness to light, to move from death to life. <clears throat> I reckon at various times over the last 12 years, I've counted how many people have become Christians in our gatherings here. And I reckon it would be about 20 20, maybe two dozen people have become Christians in our gatherings in response to the, to the preached word here. Whereas we've seen hundreds, hundreds of people become Christians in our discipleship groups. Regular, everyday disciples filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of power and the gospel, which is the power unto salvation living ordinary lives, but discipling. I mean, it seems ordinary and mundane, but that, that is the way God has chosen to work among his people to see many, many, many sons and daughters come to glory. It's wonderful. What else did they do? They pursued unity. They had everything in common. They didn't consider their stuff their stuff. This is maybe for us in 2024 in Adelaide, like in Australia, <clears throat> this might be the hardest part of this. All the rest of that, kind of, as we hear it, we're like, oh, that's the kind of community I long for. My heart desires the kind of life on life where I am known, 
truly known and yet loved and where I can truly know somebody else. You know, the, those lives lay bare, the mask off, veils down, truly known and yet truly loved kind of community. Where I have fathers and mothers speaking to my life, discipling me. I have brothers and sisters, spiritual sons and daughters I can pour my life into. How wonderful to have family. Where we eat together. Where we learn together. Where we love together. Where we're on mission together. That sounds wonderful. I think it's the thing we're made for. We spoke about this last week. <clears throat> but then we get to the cost. How do we get that? Things they didn't need, they sold to meet the need of others. Things they did need, they shared. So it's not like they just gave out of their excess. Like I've had a really, I've had a great year this year and uh, you know, here, here is what I need uh, and I've got some excess so I'll, I'll take some of that excess and I see a need, like I've got a brother or a sister or a, there's a family that's in need. There, there, there's some sickness or a husband's ran off and left his wife and kids and I can meet some of that need out of my excess. That wasn't how they rolled. They went before they even knew the need. They said, I, my stuff's not my stuff. Not that they gave their stuff to the government to then, you know, distribute communist or socialist styles, not what I'm promoting at all. What they did was they, not out of their excess, but out of their lives, they shared what they had. They went looking for need. Now, there's a difference between a need and a, and a want. It's not like someone saying, well, I want this thing you have more than I have, so you give me what you have so that I can go and get what I want. That's, not, that's also not what I'm talking about. Scripture, I mean, Paul Paul recounts this many times where he says, uh, the man who doesn't provide for his family has denied the faith. Worse than an unbeliever. He says, if you don't work, you don't eat for those who are able to work. So again, this is not some sort of socialist redistribution program. This is a life of joyful generosity that delights in seeking and filling, fulfilling need. This is the, the kind of community that, like Paul writes to the church in Galatia, he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Where they see a brother or a sister who is limping and they run in and put their shoulder under their brother or sister's shoulder to bear their burdens. That maybe that's a kind of physical example, but we're talking also about the figurative examples. Where James, Jesus' little brother, he writes, if you, see, if you see a brother or sister in need and you say, on your way, go, go and be well, without actually stepping into the need, he says, your faith is dead. That's, like, that's not faith. True faith is the faith that steps in and says, go well. Uh, you have a need. Let me meet your need. Let me step into that need. This is the kind of costly generosity that the early Christian, the, the, the early disciples, they had in their discipleship culture was to say, just like Jesus didn't grasp onto his position on the throne, but rather emptied himself, became like one of us. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. It says, likewise, echoing his generosity, we are going to be generous to one another. It's this outward trajectory of joyful generosity. They were generous, generous towards uh, the gospel workers, people who they said, well, we, we want you to help us. Like Ephesians 4 talks about, we need gifts in the church, like people to be like gifts to the church. You can equip us, the saints, for the work of the ministry. So we're going to kind of pluck them out of the workforce and help cover their living expenses so they can train us to do the work of the ministry. And I said, like, we have wonderful gospel workers. Some of them are dedicated in different areas of ministry to help equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And it's our joy to provide for their, their wage. We have overseas missionaries who do the same kind of thing where they're not here making money to kind of pad their retirement, their super, or build a bigger house, or drive a nicer car. 
but rather it's our joy to generously, joyfully support them and provide for them so that they can be about God's work in other places in the world. And likewise, where we see a need in our family, where, where there are people who need groceries, who can't keep up with inflation, the cost of living, who are sick, who can't work, who, in, like examples before, whose husbands or wives have run off on them, leaving them without finances or an ability to immediately meet their needs. It's our joy. So it's our responsibility, yes, as brothers and sisters, but it's our joy to echo the generosity of Jesus, to sacrificially meet those needs. That's what the first disciples did. And man, as one of the elders here, it is my joy to hear the stories over and over and over again, week after week, of how this is already happening in, in our discipleship community, in our family. They're about the meals being made, to hear about the money being given, the homes being opened for people to live in, the lives being opened to be shared. Man, it's amazing to see God at work among us in this very way. It's wonderful. But it's not just your money that we don't want to hoard. It's also our time. It's our talents. And so if God has gifted you, uh, say, in entrepreneurship, that you might consider your entrepreneurship a gift from God for you to steward for his glory, for your joy, and for the good of others. If God has made you a great cook or a great chef, consider how might you use that gift for, or steward that gift for God's glory, for your joy, and for the good of others. If you're a really good mechanic, consider how might God be wanting you to steward that gift for his glory, for your joy, and for the good of others. I'm not saying we, we give away all of our stuff. I'm saying we consider what we have, not our stuff, but something that God has gifted us to steward for his glory, for our joy, and for the good of others. It's a love in action. What else do they do? They connected daily. This is one of the things that I see where churches have multiple points of connection throughout the week, they are the churches that have communities that thrive. Again, not people who consider themselves an individual that sometimes goes to church to receive religious goods and services and then abstracts of the church to go live my life. And then when I have a need of a, you know, a spiritual pump up or I need prayer or uh, I, need, I need some teaching, I'll go back to the church, get the thing that I need and then come back again to my own life. You can't, again, you can't disciple people like that. You can't be discipled like that. Rather, these, the early church connected daily. One thing that I hear from people often, uh, less so, thank God, you know, in, in this community, but from Christians in churches everywhere I go, really, is people will say things like, oh, I'm just not feeling connected in my church. And again, it's usually, not always, Sometimes the church has some cultural problems, but, but usually there's people who, again, have this individual, individualistic kind of lifestyle where they come to church for religious goods and services and then abstract from church. And the less they feel connected, the less they connect. The less they connect, the less they feel connected. And they have this outward trajectory where eventually they're just out of the orbit of this family of God. And of course, they feel disconnected because there's been no connection. The early church connected every day. I'm not saying they gathered together for a Sunday gathering every day. We have this unique opportunity in all of history where we are now. We can connect with each other daily without having to be in the same location daily. So I see in our discipleship groups, most, many, probably most of our discipleship groups have like chats um, on, on the app or a group on WhatsApp or a messenger or something like this where people are daily saying, hey, uh, I have this thing on today. Would you pray for me? Bear my burden this way. I have a need in this way. Uh, we have sickness. Uh, and people will say, well, you have sickness. I will come and make you a meal. I'll pray for you. I'll bear your burdens in these kinds of ways. And so to the degree, genuinely to the degree that people connect in like this, have that kind of momentum towards 
a disciple in community. We have, they, they're the best discipleship groups. Always, I'm not saying if you have great connection, you will necessarily have great discipleship, but the best discipleship always has great connection. And so the, where the first Christians would come together and meet together, uh, we need to have multiple points of connection during the week. Daily better to encourage each other, to point each other towards Jesus, to pray for one another, to propel each other forward in the mission of, of Christ. Second to last thing, they had glad and generous hearts full of awe at what God had done and what he was doing. They weren't grumbling. Their grumbling would come. Uh, in the early church, there would be grumbling, but at this stage, not yet grumbling as they fixed their eyes on the goodness of Jesus, what he'd done for them. And for us, the key to our chief to our discipleship is fixing our eyes on who God is, what he has done, what he's doing among us, and then pointing each other to that same thing. The last thing they did together, it says they praised God. Everything they knew, witnessed, and experienced bubbled up in them individually and together as praise to the God who had loved them. And they said, and God added to the number daily those who were being saved. So not only, not only is this a wonderful community of love, of bearing burdens, of generosity, of God doing miraculous work among them, but it's an effective missional community where people are being added to their number daily, here it says. This kind of church, it's not a pipe dream. Like I said, we see pockets of this kind of community even in our own church here. We have our discipleship groups where people are becoming Christians, where they're eating together, where they're on mission together, where they're reading scripture together, where they're praying for one another, where they're bearing one another's burdens. These are, these are the five things that we've said, this is what we want our discipleship groups to look like. This is how we want to have a discipling community at City Light. We want to have discipleship groups, we call them DGs. That's what we call them, discipleship groups. They're groups for discipleship, where we would have people eating together, like gathering for the sake of gathering slowing down and sharing a meal together where they would be learners gathering under the scripture, reading the scriptures together, studying the word together, where they'll be prayers, they'll be praying together uh, for one another. They'll be bearing one another's burdens, meeting those needs and where they would be on mission together. And what we don't want to do is have that fight, like a, a checklist of five things every week. All right, here's the eating component, and here's the mission part, and here's the prayer part, and, and tick, here's the studying scripture part. Sometimes you have a discipleship group where someone's had a death in the family, or something, something devastating has happened, and it'll be just one week of just bearing burdens and praying together. We might have a week where you just share a meal together and you pray together. Or there might be a week where you're mostly just on mission together and you'll pray together. So we're not just trying to check off these five things, but typically in the regular discipling rhythm of life as the family of Jesus together, we'll see these five things echoing the first church we read here. And as a result, we'll see God receiving the glory. We'll see numbers being added and we'll see our joy being made complete. That's what we're doing. We're not trying to do anything particularly sexy or innovative or amazing. But the thing that the very first church did is the thing that we want to see in our community here. The way they made disciples then is still the same way we're making disciples now. The primary, again, the primary way we do this is in our discipleship groups where we are dedicated to the apostles' teaching, dedicated to fellowship and being together, together dedicated to the Lord's Supper and the breaking of bread, dedicated to prayer, pursuing unity and sacrificially meeting the needs of others, connecting often not out of duty but out of love for one another and to point each other to Jesus and with glad and generous hearts living this way of life. This is how we pursue discipleship. Now this is not the, okay, let's put a tick in discipleship back into 1 Corinthians next week, forget about discipleship. As we read through Corinthians, you'll see Paul is discipling the church in Corinth through his teaching. You see these same themes come up over and over and over again. Again, we're not being particularly innovative. We're doing the same 
you know, mundane, boring thing, which is not boring at all because it's how we see over and over and over again. People become more like Jesus, grow in Jesus. People come from death to life, from darkness to light, from rebellious sinners to redeemed sons and daughters. It's what we've reoriented all of our lives around so that God will get the glory, we would be filled with joy, and we'd work for the good of others. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we want to thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus. That over and over and over again, you've proven these things to be true as we have dedicated ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to the prayers and to the breaking of the bread and to fellowship together. You're glorified among us. We are filled with joy, glad and generous hearts. And we see many sons and daughters come into the kingdom. You're so good to us. And we're thankful for every way you've answered prayer over the last 12 years here and over the last many thousands of years as your people turn to you, put our, put our trust in you and ask for you to move in obedience to your prompting by Spirit. So we're asking again, help us to be a family of disciple makers. Help us have those glad and generous hearts we've just read about. Father, this be a community where, a family where uh, needs are met joyfully and sacrificially. Where we gather because you've commanded us to gather because we're family, because we love one another. Where we remember Jesus, what he's done for us as we uh, come around the table. And in every way would you be glorified among us. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.